Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is a wonderful site after having been closed for so many months to public gatherings. This is wonderful to see all of you here at the Coral Gables Congregational United Church of Christ. So welcome. I'm Lori Hafner. I'm the senior pastor here. And on behalf of all of our members and staff, I'm so pleased to welcome you, as I already said, to one of our first public gatherings since COVID. And I can't think of a better way to open our doors to the community than for the arts, which is something that this congregation is so committed to, believing that beauty and creativity, music and artistry inspire, call us to self-reflection, empathy, vision, and deeper spiritual connections. I'm also so pleased that we are partnering today with our dear friends from the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. It's been our honor to work with them and to partner with them over so many years to provide intriguing, meaningful, and awe-inspiring programs of all kinds. And to our dear friends of the Florida Grand Opera, we are delighted to welcome you back into this beautiful historic space and to share with you this special event today. So once again, everyone, welcome to this church where we say each and every time that we gather, no matter who you are or where you are on your life journey, you are welcome here. And indeed, each of you are this day. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend, Pedro Boda. Thank you, Pastor Lori. Um, on behalf of the Stephen J. Green School of International Public Affairs at FIU and our founding dean, Dr. John F. Stack, Jr., I want to welcome all of you this afternoon. We are really delighted to be back in this beautiful space after a long hiatus. This is the fifth collaboration between the Green School, the Florida Grand Opera, and Coral Gables Congregational United Church of Christ. We have gathered like this since 2015 to explore powerful universal themes related to the human condition. The Green School is so grateful to have these strong community partnerships that allow us to bring an incredible depth of programming to our community. I want to acknowledge the Ruth K. and Shepherd Broad Distinguished Lecture Series for its generous sponsorship of today's event. Today we will enjoy a very special program that highlights the piercing themes of Gregory Spears' celebrated opera, Fellow Travelers, based on the best-selling novel by Thomas Mallon. Spoken word set against Spears' powerful music, Destination Retrograde, explores the opera's tragic story of a love affair between two young men at the height of the red and lavender scares in the 1950s while highlighting the underlying and timely topics of disinformation, the relationship between law and morality, and the dangers of a tyranny of the majority. The program, of course, will feature the magnificent voices of Florida Grand Opera artists and the spoken word of FIU scholars, including Ambassador Martin Palosh, director of FIU's Václav Havel Program for Human Rights and Diplomacy, Dr. Ofelia Riqueses, the Havel Program's Senior Program Coordinator, and I must add, the one who did the heavy lifting in pulling this event together. So thank you for that, Ophelia. <laughs> and my dear friend, Dr. Jesse Abu Arab, visiting assistant professor with FIU's Center for Women's and Gender Studies. The Green School very recently launched a new and ambitious initiative LGBTQ plus rights as human rights, to serve as a platform for investigating the status of LGBTQ plus communities around the world. In many countries across the globe, and yes, even here at home, LGBTQ plus individuals face relentless persecution, denigration, and violence. To have agency over one's identity and to be able to self-express we believe is a fundamental human right and one that is denied to millions of people, often for political reasons and cultural reasons. 
We hope that our modest efforts will bring awareness of the plight of these individuals who live in fear of simply being who they are. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce my friend and co-partner in this endeavor, Susan Danis, the General Director and the CEO of the Florida Grand Opera. Susan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just wanted to add my greetings today, thank the pastor, thank Pedro, and just talk about, as I listen to these comments, uh, just really how much this is about community. Um, an incredible church that is part of community, an incredible institution of higher learning where on a Sunday afternoon, um, distinguished professors, incredible singers, and our staffs come together to, to shed light on this very, very important topic. Uh, we've been doing each year as part of our season since 2013, our Made for Miami series, which specifically focuses on one of the, quote, special communities or the important communities in South Florida. Um, we're really, really proud of that, and we're really, really, really proud of the partnership that we have and also shedding light on this really important topic. So without further ado, and it's great to speak last because everyone else has said everything, um, I introduce our Director of Artistic Administration for some commentary and introductions, Mitch Rowe. I will join in one last welcome. I hope everyone feels welcome now at this point. Um, just to really drive home how excited we are to be here with all of you and to have this conversation um, and discuss the relevant topics and importantly, this beautiful, melodic 21st century opera, fellow travelers. To quote the director of the production, Peter Rothstein, he said, Gregory Pierce and Gregory Spears have created an extraordinary work of music theater, maximizing what opera can do, that drama without music simply cannot. Music steps in where words fail. The characters who inhabit fellow travelers are often unable to speak the truth, sometimes because of ignorance and other times because of devastating fear. Theirs is a love that dare not speak its name. So let's jump in to the topics. Uh, the late 1940s through the 1950s, the Red Scare swept the nation. Strongly led by Senator Joseph McCarthy, who was preoccupied with the perception that American and foreign communists were infiltrating US society and government. McCarthyism is the term you would hear for this time in history as well, a time when accusations and fear-mongering became a ritual. In 1953, President Eisenhower signed an executive order, uh, Order 10,450, normalizing persecution of homosexual women and men, banning them from working in the US government. <clears throat> it became known as the Lavender Scare, Thousands of women and men working in the United States and abroad lost their government jobs and were publicly outed. As a result, many were stricken of their livelihood. They were um, ostracized by their families, their communities, and their country. Many of them even took their own lives. So joining us now to speak on more on disinformation is Martin Palush. Good afternoon. I mean it honored to be given an opportunity to say a few words under this special occasion. Let me open my intervention by a quote from the Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism, a magisterial book about major political disease of our times, published for the first time in the early 1950s, in the atmosphere of the Cold War, when the story of fellow travelers, first in the form of novel, 
and later turned into a libretto of opera, was unfolding. The idle subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction, which means the, between real, uh, the right of experience and the distinction between true and false, like the standard of thought, no longer exist. When reading this, I could not escape an unpleasant personal question. Did I myself, at least in certain period of my life, belong to this category? I was born in Czechoslovakia in 1950, and for more than half of my life, I was sur uh, uh, surrounded by the reality of communism imposed on my country after the World War II. Uh, finding myself as a member of middle-class bourgeois family in the past, I had multiple opportunities to experience its evil nature, seeing, for instance, my relatives, political prisoners returning from communist jails after many years spent there, but had no other choice than to accept it as a reality and live in it as well as I could, trying to search for truth in it uh, and thus escape my inherent ignorance, uh, famous uh, statement from the first book of Aristotle's Metaphysics, trying to understand myself and establish under the given circumstances the distinction between true and false in the best way I was able to. I have to admit my perception of America was blindfully uninformed and rather naive in these formative years. I still remember my boyish excitement when seeing my first Western movie, it was The High Noon, with Gary Cooper from 1951, brought to, the Czech uh, to, Czechoslo to Czechoslovak, uh, Czechoslovak cinemas only in the beginning of the golden 60s, when the process of destalinization was in the full swing and the winds of change were blowing even in our communist earthly paradise. Uh, the United States was for me when I was entering into my teens and starting to orientate myself in the world of adults, an unknown but highly esteemed big country of my dreams. Uh, certainly not a hostile imperialistic superpower. I never thought that it was perfect, but a country of freedom and well-functioning democracy an essentially open society with its unique history, traditions, tragedies, problems, and challenges, reflected in all forms of American culture, firmly embedded in the constitutional and political traditions. So what is my take on the fellow travelers uh, that show the US realities in the 1950s from a perspective that is very different from mine? What is the message we all should bring home from here and to think about? Should we draw a set conclusion that when it comes to power politics, there is no essential difference between totalitarianism and liberal democracy? My affirmative answer to this question is clear, no. There is a fundamental distinction between these two forms of government. At the same time, however, I have to admit an inconvenient reality that whole Western civilization uh, that has developed in the modern period of human history on the both sides of Atlantic has fallen into deep, both spiritual and political crisis. That we are all in it, that the lessons made by those who were and maybe people around uh, the globe still are exposed to the totalitarian radiation uh, in their lives are important, and not only for those who consider themselves to be heirs of Europe, with uh, the roots in ancient Greek city-states and in their invention of politics and philosophy, but for the whole global of mankind inhabiting the planet Earth in the beginning of the third decade of the 21st century. Here is again a quote from Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism, more than 70 years old, but sounding like something that could be easily written today. Never has our future been more unpredictable. Never uh, have we depended 
so much on political forces that cannot be trusted to follow the rules of common sense and self-interest. Forces that look like sheer insanity if judged by the standards of other centuries. It is as thought mankind had divided itself between those who believe in human omnipotence, who think that everything is possible, if one knows how to organize masses for it, and those for whom powerlessness has become the major experience of their lives. It is evident that power of disinformation in our electronic age is tremendous, that the whole human uh, global mankind, uh, uh, those who, us who are the best beati possidentes, fortunate inhabitants of prosperous and the peaceful liberal democracies included, live today in distress and fears, surrounded by the postmodern climate of ideas, immersed in the post-truth discourse, confounding facts and opinions, generating all sorts of fake news and second imaginary realities, opening the path for endless manipulations with political reality experienced, when uh, anything, nothing is true and everything is possible, bringing reckless and egomaniacal demagogues to power and offering them an opportunity to articulate their uh, phantasmagories, to pursue their own personal goals and interests. What I would like to uh, do here, however, instead of start blaming someone for this state of things, is to offer you what was coming to my mind when trying to get acquainted with fellow, fellow travelers. I believe with Hannah Arendt uh, that to restore our damaged relation to the factual truth, we need to good storytellers uh, uh, someone who will not feed our anger and deepen our fears, but who can help us to reconcile ourselves with the surrounding reality, who is capable of transforming the given raw material of sheer happenings into a piece of art, a kind of drama with its beginning, its middle, and its end, who is a real poet endowed with the divine capacity to transfigure the moods and movements of heart, and thus to turn, in the Arendt's words, grief to lamentations, jubilations into praise, who is capable of bringing the audience here, right now, and anywhere around, around the world, with the help of such transfiguration to the catharsis, cleansing or purging of all emotions, that could prevent men from making a sound and balanced judgments following the, by prudent and effective actions. Let me conclude uh, by one more, and this time quite lengthy quote from Hannah Arendt. Persuasion and violence can destroy truth, but they cannot replace it. To look upon politics from the perspective of truth means to take one stand outside the political realm. The standpoint is the standpoint of the truth teller who forfeits his position if he tries to interfere directly, speak the language of persuasion of violent, or of violence. The standpoint outside the political realm is clearly characterized as one of the various moods of being alone. Outstanding among the existential modes of truth-telling are the solitude of the philosopher, the isolation of the scientist and the artist, the impartiality of historian and the judge, and the independence of the fact-finder, the witness, and the reporter. But uh, this cannot possibly tell the whole story. It leaves out of account certain public institutions established and supported by the power that be in which, contrary to all political rulers, truth and truthfulness have always constituted the highest criterion of speech and endeavor. Among these, we find notably the judiciary, 
which either as a branch of government or as a direct administration of justice, is carefully protected against social and political power, as well as all institutions of higher learning to which the state entrusts the education of its future citizens. To the extent uh, that the academic member remembers the ancient origins, it must know that it was founded by the policy's most determined and most influential opponent. To be sure, Plato's dream didn't come true. The academic never became a counter-society, and nowhere do we hear of any attempt by the universities at seizing power. But what Plato never dreamed of did become true. The political realm recognized that it needed an institution outside the power struggle in addition to the impartiality required in the administration of justice. For whether these places of higher learning are in private or in public hands is of no great importance. Not only their integrity, but their very existence depends upon the goodwill of the government anyway. Very Unwelcome truths have emerged from the universities and very unwelcome judgments have been handed down from the bench time and again. And these institutions, like other remaining shelters of truth, have remained exposed to all the dangers arising from social and political power. Yet the chances for truth to prevail in public are, of course, greatly improved by the mere existence of such places and by the organization of independent, supposedly disinterested scholars associated with them. This authentically political significance of academe is today easily overlooked because of the prominence of its professional schools and the evolution of its uh, natural science divisions where unexpectedly poor research has yielded so many decisive results that have proven vital to the country at large. No one can possibly gainsay the social and technical usefulness of the universities, but this importance is not political. The historical sciences and the humanities, which are supposed to find out, stand guard over, and interpret factual truth and human uh, documents are politically of great relevance. And I would uh, very proudly associate myself with not only our program, with FIU's Green School, with our founding dean, uh, John Stack, and with FIU in general, because that's one of these institutions. There is no doubt that all these politically relevant functions are performed from outside, of, outside the political realm. They require non-commitment and impartiality, freedom from self-interest in thought and judgment. The disinterested pursuit of truth has a long history. I think it can be traced back to the times before Western politics and philosophy were born or invented, to the moment when Homer chose to sing the deeds of the Trojans no less than those of Achaeans and to praise the glory of Hector, the foe and the defeated man, no less than the glory of Achilles, the hero of his kinfolk. Homeric impartiality echoes throughout Greek history, and it inspired the first great teller of factual truth, who became the father of history. Herodotus tells us in the fir very first sentence of his stories that he set out to prevent the great and wondrous deed of Greeks and the barbarians from losing their due meat of glory. This is the root of all so-called objectivity. The curious possession unknown outside Western civilization for intellectual integrity at any price. Without it, no science would ever have, been born, be, uh, have come into being. I've spoken here thought the, uh, as thought political realm were no more than a battlefield of partial conflicting interest, where nothing counted but pleasure and profit, partisanship, and the lust for domain. From this perspective, we remain unaware of the actual content of political life, of the joy and 
gratification that arise out of being in company with our peers, our of, out of acting together and appearing in public, out of inserting ourselves into the world by word and deed, thus acquiring and sustaining our personal identity and beginning something entirely new. However, what I meant to show here is that this whole sphere, it, uh, its greatness notwithstanding, is limited. That it does not encompass the whole of man's and world's existence. It is limited to those things which man cannot change at will. And it is only by respecting its own borders that this realm where we are free and act and to change can remain intact, preserving its integrity and keeping its promises. Conceptually, uh, we may call truth what we cannot change. Metaphorically, it is the ground on which we stand and the sky that stretches above us. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, so we'll move on into a little bit of music from the opera. So Fellow Travelers is very much an ensemble piece. Every scene relies on several different characters to tell this story and, and to move it along. Um, it could be, for the most part, considered a through-composed piece, which means there are not a lot of re repeating sections um, or verses throughout. It just kind of moves along, keeps moving from scene to scene. Um, what we're about to hear is a very special moment in the opera because it's one of the only times that we get a proper aria in the show. And Tim Laughlin is the character, and he's seen alone on stage to share this experience. Um, so I'll set up from the beginning of the opera to this moment, I'll do it very quickly, um, is um, Tim Laughlin is a young reporter and he's sitting on a bench in DC and he's approached by Hawkins Fuller. Hawk is how he goes by in the show. And he's a State Department employee. <clears throat> Hawk has put in a good word for Tim um, and gets him a job as a speechwriter for Senator Charles Potter. So Timothy goes to Hawk's office to drop off a thank you gift where he meets his assistant and best friend, Mary Johnson. This will be important for later on. And Miss Lightfoot, who is the assistant to Mary Johnson, who then, when Tim leaves, starts mocking him and kind of into this situation of, oh, he's probably one of them, you know, type of situations. Um, Tim is now in this scene in his apartment and he's making dinner and Hawk arrives unexpectedly to tell him stories of Bermuda, his favorite place of vacation, and oh, we should take you there sometime. But he is really there for another reason. He shows up. Um, in this aria last night, um, reveals Tim in a situation, it's, it's the afterglow of his first same-sex experience. And we see him torn between his deep Catholicism and his passion, his growing passion for this man who's just kind of unexpectedly shown up in his life and has already done things for him and has shown you know, a certain amount of care for him. So to perform this is David Margulies and Jared Perun.
Thank you. Ooh, that piece gets me every time. I mean, that struggle between having just felt something you've never experienced before, the butterflies, the joy, um, and then something that you're stuck to that you don't know if it's true or not. You know, as he says in the text, like, what's real? What isn't? Am I supposed to believe? I've been told this over and over and over again, but am I allowed to change that? Is, is there another way? How can I find myself through that? Um, that struggle, I think, is something that we all have can relate to um, on some level in any of our lives. And so the lavender scare, you know, was kind of this, uh, uh, this moral panic, you know, and being led by politicians and being led by laws, giving we the people more reason to struggle against ourselves. So now joining us to speak on this law of uh, law and morality is uh, Dr. Ophelia Riquezes. Thank you for the introduction. Well, that is obviously a very tough act to follow. Um, today, I'm going to briefly address the relationship between law and morality. I happen to share Ambassador Pelush's love and admiration for, for Hannah Arendt's work, so I will also quote her during my intervention, though surely not as eloquently as, as he did. While reporting on the trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she was sent on assignment by the New Yorker, Arendt, who was informed by her own experience as a, of Nazi Germany as a Jew, came to an astounding and controversial conclusion. Eichmann wasn't a profoundly evil individual. He wasn't even particularly devoted to the party's ideology. Instead, he was simply unable to exercise independent thought. In, in 1971, Arendt would offer a concrete definition of what she called the banality of evil. In her words, it refers to the phenomenon of evil deeds committed on a gigantic scale, which could not be traced to any particularity of wickedness, pathology, or ideological conviction in the doer." End of quote. Through her work, Arendt warns against the dangers inherent to blind obedience in general, and defends the human capacity for exercising independent judgment, even in the most extreme of circumstances of which she was a direct witness. The third trial of the 12 that were held in Nuremberg after the end of World War II was known as a judge's trial. The defendants were German jurists and lawyers accused by the tribunal of, quote, judicial murder and other atrocities, which they committed by destroying law and justice in Germany, and then utilizing the emptied forms of legal process for the persecution, enslavement, and extermination on a large scale, end of quote. All of the defendants pled not guilty. Although all Nuremberg trials were permeated by this debate, perhaps it is the judge's trial which more clearly underlines the question of compliance in the face of injustice. Should an individual be held responsible for enforcing or complying with binding laws if their content is unjust? Can a person be reasonably expected or even obliged to exercise independent judgment when, as Aaron pointed out, evil ceases to be a temptation and becomes a norm? While Eichmann was a law-abiding citizen during the Third Reich, he played a pivotal role in the Nazis' final solution. And while the defendants in the judge's trial claimed protection under the, the, the principle of nullum crimen sine lege, meaning their actions were not criminal under domestic law at the time they were committed, the tribunal rejected the notion that such a defense could exempt the wrongdoers from responsibility for participating in a, quote, nationally organized system of injustice and persecution that was shocking to the moral sense of mankind, end of quote. Western legal tradition has been shaped by this age-old debate between two approaches to the law, legal positivism and natural law theory. At their core, these theories revolve around the source of existence and validity of the law. Is the latter to be regarded as a mere social fact, regardless of merit or content, or must it adhere to certain ideals or moral principles? 
Is there a necessary connection between law and morality? This debate, to be sure, had its stellar moment during the Nuremberg trials, which made painfully clear that formally valid laws could be transformed and used to allow the most heinous crimes against humanity. However, its relevance is far from being constrained to the past. Many of Western civilization's most brilliant minds have contributed to the discussion. And as is the case in many matters of philosophy, there are no definitive answers. While positivism emphasizes the conventional nature of law and its validity as a social construct, natural law theory claims that there are necessary moral constraints to its content. John Locke, one of the most influential political philosophers of the modern age, argued that all men are by nature free and equal and that they enter into a social contract becoming bound to a government and its laws in order to ensure the better enjoyment of their rights. Natural law is, in fact, one of the key components of his rich philosophy. But what happens when the law ceases to ensure such enjoyment of rights or arbitrarily impedes it? The roots of legal positivism, on the other hand, can be found in the works of Thomas Hobbes and David Hume. Although differing in many aspects, legal positivists do not disregard the law's merits as unimportant, as it is frequently misinterpreted, but only claim that those merits do not determine whether the laws exist or bind. The legal system depends on the existence of a sovereign, of governing structures, and not on the fulfillment of an ideal of justice. Fellow Travelers presents us with a recent example of this tension in the context of the American democracy of the mid-20th century. The Red and Lavender Scares are well-known chapters of United States history. A series of congressional investigations led to reports that institutionalized discrimination and urged government agencies to ban employees guilty of immoral conduct and to the passing of Pre President Eisenhower's 1953 executive order titled Security Requirements for Government Employment, which explicitly added sexuality to the criteria used to determine suitability for federal employment. In 1948, the law titled To Provide for the Treatment of Sexual Psychopaths in the District of Columbia was adopted. By then, across the nation, sodomy laws had been, had been used to punish same-sex conduct. The American legal system included provisions that resulted in the unemployment, exclusion, ruin, and emotional distress of thousands of individuals based solely on their sexual orientation. The story told by Gregory Spears' opera and Mellon's novel, of course, is, among many other things, a call to reflect on the purpose and the nature of the law. Such discrimi discriminatory provisions were indeed formally valid, but, but should the law, even if an expression of a social consensus, serve an ideal of justice? The very notion of human rights, which developed rapidly in the decades following World War II, rests on the idea that every individual is entitled to the protection of basic freedoms and to equality under the law. Based on the recognition of our inherent dignity, human rights serve both as a guiding principle and as a limit to the social construction of the law. And international law is particularly relevant in this regard. Interestingly enough, Hannah Arendt argued that the natural law versus legal positivism dilemma was a delusion, speaking instead of the law not as a command, but as an instrument for creating relationships under the Roman maxim pacta sunt servanda, which means agreements must be kept. With such shameful episodes in our past, and many even in our present, it serves us well to remember her crucial warning and to exercise our ability, or our duty, really, to think about our actions and their consequences as inhabitants of a shared world. Regardless of what might warrant consensus as a norm at a specific moment in time and in any political system, democratic or not, the condition to exercise independent thought lies simply, according to Arendt, in the willingness to start that dialogue between me and myself, which, since Socrates and Plato, we call thought. Thank you. So interesting how going off, off script now, I guess, is 
you know, laws, we have morality in the way we were raised and the way that we're taught, but laws kind of make us think that. Like, when do we get to think freely? When do, you know, at what point is, what is law and morality? Anyway, I'll go on forever, so I, I and I won't. Um, picking up uh, from the opera, Mary Johnson, who I mentioned earlier, um, is Hawk's assistant and best friend. She invites Tim over to her place to warn Tim about Hawk's nature. She says, there are times that I wish I didn't know him well. And as I was driving over here, I was listening to this today. And you'll hear in the music um, a lot of you know high notes and some really fast flourishes um, in the voice. And I was thinking, about that kind of what was the composer thinking is this her crying out and then I thought you know there are situations where I think that Mary we see her at one point probably was in love with Hawk herself um, and was his assistant and, and fallen in love with this person and then comes to find out that it's never going to happen for her. She's never going to get to have him in that capacity. And while she still loves him and cares about him, perhaps, this is my own thinking of it, is, is that perhaps some of this is like that screaming out to Tim, like there's jealousy maybe of Tim that he's got to share this emotional connection, this physical connection with Hawk that she'll never get to have, and sometimes she just wishes that it didn't happen. Like, I wish he was just my boss, and I wish he was just my friend, and, um, and so you'll hear some of that, and I think that is kind of important to say also in those situations. You know, we're told so often um, that this is wrong and that's wrong, and we don't know why or what it is, but it also affects other people in a way that we didn't even mean to harm them or didn't want to hurt their feelings, but because of what we were told, it just was kind of inflicted upon them through us because of something else that was happening. Um, so in this, it go, she goes on further in this scene. So the scene, there are actually three people. There's, there's Mary Johnson, there's Tim, and Hawk comes into the scene as well. And she goes on to tell Tim um, that she's pregnant from a one-night stand. So now her whole life is changed because now she's also being faced with this I'm going to be ostracized. She's never been, she's always been accepted. She's always been, everything's been up and up for her. But now all of a sudden, her family could leave her in the dark. Her community could leave her in the dark because she's pregnant from this one night stand. Um, so she shares this concern um, with Tim. Um, but I think, you know, some of it is her concern for herself and how she'll be treated in her current situation. So to share this little excerpt um, called I Worry from the operas Laura Leon and Jared Pern.
I think I'll start referring to that as Mary's lament from now on <laughs> is, so right after that in the opera, you know, she, she just said, um, sometimes I wish I didn't know him so well, if you know what I mean. It's the, if you know what I mean, has a couple of ways you could go with that. And what we see after this in the opera, Hawk comes to Timothy's apartment again to celebrate that he's been cleared of all allegations of homosexuality. So he's in a really good space and he wants to celebrate by bringing a third into their situation. And um, Timothy is shocked and does not want this for himself, for his life. And there's another part of this, if you know what I mean. This is, this is a side of Hawk that Mary has seen and knows well. And Tim has not yet seen all of that. He's seen who he thinks this man is, who he is in his life. And then there's this other part. There's the other, if you know what I mean, you know, thing. Um, and he tells, Tim goes on to say, um, to tell Hawk that, you know, I've stopped taking communion because it hasn't been to worship him. I've been worshiping you. And I need to, I need you to go. Y you, need, you need to leave. Um, and he had to, Tim is in that situation where he had to break his own heart to be able to start a new chapter or find a new place to go. You know, there are so many expectations in any circle that one runs in. You know, we all have to keep up with the Joneses. Um, so joining us to speak now on this tyranny of the majority is uh, Dr. Abu Arab. Thank you for inviting me for this wonderful event. Um, so deep, so powerful, I really appreciate it. Again, you see a lot of emotions and you see you know, a, a story moving on from you know, the systems of oppression to laws and states and then now getting to the tyranny of the majority within you know, society. So again, uh, building off of uh, the story, John Stuart Mill's moral and political theory of liberty and representation warns against these systems of oppression that happen within democracies if they're not checked well, right? If uh, they might lead to tyranny. And what is coined by the tyranny of majority would be a serious crime because it is committed by who? People, society. What I, what I enjoyed that you mentioned that, you know, the banality of evil, people internalizing this system, accepting them as they are not able to, you know, contest them, uh, have a dialogue, conversation, see where do they come from, or should they be right, these laws and whatnot. So these are serious crimes committed by society against its member because it takes away the diversity, it takes away the inclusion of its people, their individual liberties, their freedom of expression, their freedom from oppression, and it doesn't stop at that institutional level where you have laws. It is committed on everyday basis by people, peers, friends, including themselves, the people who do not identify like them, who feel that there's a fight between them. Am I wrong? Am I right? What's, what do I do? So this is, called, like, this is coined as inegalitarian inclusivity, where it's dangerous because people are forced to conform to these dominant norms, to the dominant rules that come from top, right? What is coined as the majority. Is it majority by number, proportionality, people in power that leads to totalitarianism, this majority that encourage, instead of encouraging and celebrating these diversities, right, of one's individuality, they push them to conform to become a certain person in a way they behave in certain ways and uh, whatnot. So the fellow travelers, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, reading the excerpt and enjoyed listening to you all because it explores this intersectional system 
right? It's not black and white. There's intellectual systems of privileges and oppression within these characters, right? The differences between Tim and Hawk and the dominant, how dominant groups and norms, just because they are in certain status, in certain class, certain race, certain gender, certain ethnicity and whatnot, put them in a certain position to kind of discriminate against each other, right? To kind of use who can and who cannot, right? And in a way, uh, based on the sexuality, the stories, right? The discrimination on who can and cannot and wish to kind of abide by these norms. So excluding the rights and interests of minority groups, preventing them from getting any way support that they need to live a life free from harm and, uh, and tyranny, right? It provides certain expectations that punishes, you know, not just the people uh, uh, at stake, but the community around them, their peers, their friends, their colleagues, their, their employees and whatnot. So this um, concept, the, that, that, that Michel Foucault coins the internalization, right? The disciplining of not just through laws, but an individual's body, right? We saw it before by praying and saying, and that having that in, internal conflict where an individual's body becomes a tool for those, uh, for the majority, for the tyranny of majority. They become agents in disciplining each other. They push to call each other out, they push to think that they're wrong and they're criminalized and, and negative and there's some guilt and shame and all these negative feelings that push to self-hated even committing suicide or being ostracized or uh, being bullied and what we see today again. So by uh, adopting this kind of, uh, you know, uh, internalized oppression, you know, the oppressed becomes the oppressor, become the kind of the tools that discipline the society. It's working on its own. You don't need any more um, a person from the above to, to, to make it happen. The negative stereotypes that kind of internalized within, this toxic masculinity that we see until today that kind of affect what is normal, what is normalized, how, violence can, how, how people can get away with certain types of violence. So, when it comes to, and this is what we call the body politics, when it reaches your own body, right? An individual internalizes this and creates these prejudices about themselves, about others, the biases, and in a way have this identity conflict, like who they are. So their agency to resist these laws is diminished, and their feeling of criminality as they're doing something wrong is heightened. So. Again, their queerness is ostracized. Um, and my colleague mentioned before the Sex Perversion Elimination Act that literally one says, one pansy can pollute an entire government office for they are sinful, perverted, lacking moral and mental strength, the justification that have been used. So again, I don't feel that much change from the decades, four decades of lavender scare, four decades of lavender scare. Do you know the saying, like, same, same, but different, right? Even though it's not about those actual uh, laws that kind of ban somebody from the government spaces, but there are so many spaces that are not available for certain groups. It doesn't matter just their gender or their sexuality, ethnicity, religion, all this stuff. It, 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 there, are, there are many pockets where religion, patriotism, national security, oh my God, they're gonna call us out because of their sexuality and all that stuff. So I really think this work is highly significant because it voices out the hidden stories Many said that, yes, many people know the lavender scare. I teach this uh, class about it, and trust me, not, many do not, right? Same as the pink triangle and whatnot, because those are hidden stories within our uh, oppressive histories, right? The struggle of those minority and are not really articulated because it's very hard to get together because of those segregated spaces that are gentrified. So again, public misperception, misrepresentation, all need to be unpacked and learned in, uh, within uh, higher education and all open public spaces. Unfortunately, many spaces here within our own backyard have kind of occulted from us. We have certain states and whatnot that ban these spaces to, to happen, right? And having that inclusivity, homophobic perception and practices of discrimination are happening every day. So 
who, how, who, who knows the person called Royal Poetical Stars, for example, right? Bo Royal Poetical Stars is a 26-year-old black transgender woman who was fatally shot in our own backyard, Miami Gardens, Florida, on October 2nd, 2021. Not many put it on TV. Uh, the, n nobody heard about it. If, I, if it wasn't for my own research and my students, I wouldn't even know about it. And Royal Stars is one of 40 people that were killed in 2021. Again, numbers and stories are highly uh, you know, uh, misled because of the media and, and the report. Again, often these deaths not only get unreported, but also misreported. In the case of Royal Stars, she changed her name legally. But still, when the police did their uh, report, they misgendered her, right? So again, these intersectional uh, um, layers of oppression, we need to pay attention because of royal stars, the gender, ethnicity, sexuality, all these stuff, it, they were put in that position. While others, because of you know, toxic masculinity, heterosexual, uh, heteronationalism, and all that stuff, are more highlighted. So I want to end it with John Stuart Mill, who was a pioneer in the 1800s, when women were actually property, who he was pushing for, you know what, inclusivity and diversity is not just because I want to be nice to somebody. But that majority, which is not by numbers, will be hurting itself, its own people, its own families, because those people are part of your community and you need to celebrate their individuality. So in John, Wimmer's, uh, in John Stuart Mill's words, so long as the right of the strong to power over the weak rules in the very heart of the society, the attempt to make equal right of the weak the principle of its outward action will always be an uphill struggle. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's, it's interesting, you know, we're on, we think that we're advancing so much as a society, you know, we have, we're on iPhone 67 or something, you know, now, um, and that somehow translates into, oh no, we're advancing, we're, we're advancing, but it's like everything's kind of just staying the same, it just shifts, you know, kind of just keeps shifting around and, you know, it's different now, but it's all kind of on the same level you know, and um, this opera is like an onion. There are so many, there are so many layers to peel back um, about who we are, where we are, um, and so we're really excited to present that. Thank you to all of our speakers today. We really appreciate it to help, to help show that, improve how important it is. We, we really thank you for that. Uh, we opened the opera in April 22, 2022 um, in the Lauder Hill Performing Arts Center in Broward County. So we look forward to seeing you there and thank you for being here and have a great afternoon. <laughs>